Do you like blade singers? How about moon druids? Have you ever wondered if combining the two together would make a viable character in D&D? Well, I've got some news for you. It would. It really would. Keep watching to learn more. Welcome to D4. Hey everybody, so here at D4, each week we take a deep dive into character builds for our favorite role-playing games. I like to crunch numbers about them, theorycraft about them, not so that I can tell you the right way or the best way to play a certain character, but to explore one potential way to build something that you're thinking about playing with the hopes of creating a character that is both really powerful but also really fun to play. So if you enjoy creating characters for your favorite role-playing games almost as much as you enjoy playing the actual game itself, or if you're just looking for tips or ideas on how to build something that you're thinking about playing, then welcome home. This is where you belong, and I am so glad you're here. So thanks for watching. My name's Colby. I put out videos every Tuesday, so if you enjoy what you see, I hope that you will like the video and comment and subscribe to the channel and even click the notifications bell so that you don't miss an episode. So, we have arrived. Today is the day where I do the final build inspired by the Dungeon Dude's amazing tier ranking multi-class options for every class series. Uh, watch it here if you haven't. It's my favorite series of videos they've ever done, and that's actually really saying something. But I have had so much fun building stuff based on usually what Kelly and Monty deem in their videos as not that great a combination, or sometimes stuff that they specifically call me out on. And I'm a little sad to see the series end. So here's hoping that they start a new series talking about the best three class combos in the future that I can keep playing with. But yes, today we are finally taking a look at the wizard. And I've said this before on this channel, but it probably bears repeating, oh boy, that's a pun. It's really hard to multi-class out of wizard, right? Of course, I've done it like a billion times. I'm not saying that it's never worth it, but spells and spellcasters are just so dang powerful in D&D 5e especially. And with the wizard in particular, who has access to the best spell list in the game, there's just kind of a spell for everything you want to do. So delaying access to your stronger spells and more and higher spell slots can be really difficult. If you're multi-classing so that you can do something in game a little better, chances are there's a spell for that. And so you can almost always accomplish the same thing by just staying straight wizard and not sacrificing getting more and better spells instead of taking levels in another class, right? Of course, yes, there are exceptions to that rule. And for me, the one that stands out maybe the most clearly is when you're trying to do sustained damage with a wizard. Outside of a few instances, most notably something involving Eldritch Blast, if you want to build for strong, sustainable, round over round damage, you're going to be better off working weapons into the mix as a caster. And for wizards, that means you're probably going bladesinger. Straight class bladesingers are of course potentially great at sustainable weapon damage, as I think I've shown on this channel, right? But you can also arguably get some good mileage out of multiclassing with your bladesinger to maybe pick up some great tanking capabilities or burst damage capabilities or support capabilities. To date, I've done a bladesinger build multiclassed with Artificer, Cleric, Fighter, uh, multiple actually, Monk, and yes, even Warlock. So almost half of the classes available in D&D 5e. But one of the classes that I have never mixed with Bladesinger is Druid. For what I think are obvious reasons. But in that wizard multiclass video that the Dungeon Dudes did, Monty threw down the gauntlet when he said, If you're a Moon Druid being a bear singer and being a bear and having like the temporary hit point buffer that the bear things, that's a weird build to me. Colby, what do you think? At first when I heard Monty say this, I kind of laughed and I was like, no way, that's just ridiculous and terrible. But I mean, I can't turn down a direct challenge, can I? And the more I thought about it, the more I started to realize, you know what? This thing might have legs, four legs to be precise. <laughs> Seriously though, there are weaknesses to the Moon Druid that Bladesinger can potentially really shore up. And there is power and versatility to the Druid and maybe especially the Moon Druid that the Bladesinger Wizard could really benefit from. So alright, challenge accepted. Let's take a look at it in D&D build 149, the Blade Druid, the Bear Singer, the Singing Bear, the Moonblade, ooh, that's nice. 
<laughs> Except we don't really use a blade on this character, so that feels like it's a little bit of a misleading title. How about the Moon Song? Or maybe best of all, the Moon Singer. Yeah, I like that. That sounds nice and romantic and kind of mystical. Way more than the singing bear, anyway. <laughs> Huge thanks to my good friend Randall Hampton for the fantastic artwork that he created for this character concept. He does this every week. He's such an amazing artist. If you'd be interested in following him on social media to check out the other stuff that he's done, or potentially reach out to see if you can commission him to create some art for your character or your entire party even, I will put links in the video description on how to do so. But first, you guys, if you love lovely things as much as I do, please lend me your ears for just two minutes because I really want to tell you about one of my favorite companies in the world, the Tabletop Candle Company. These guys make the most delicious smelling candles of all time, all inspired by your favorite role-playing class archetypes. Now, I am, as most of you probably know by this point, a hedonistic sensory junkie. Few things bring me more joy than good food, beautiful art, harmonies, rainstorms, and yes, wonderful smelling things. And Tabletop Candle Company makes a lot of wonderful smelling things. Plus, they make lots of wonderful smelling things that remind me of my favorite game. Each candle they make is scented differently, themed around classes. My very favorites are, let me get them. Cleric, peonies, lavender, and sandalwood. Oh my gosh, that smells so like fresh and clean and yummy. And they even have these little like wax dice that kind of melt as the candle burns, which is so cool. You can actually buy those wax melters just individually if you have like a wax melty thing and they smell just as good. Um, monk, of course, right? That's like orange blossom, sage, amber, so good. But then my favorite of all, actually, this is a slightly smaller size because I already burned through the large one that they sent me, uh, the Druid. Appropriate for today's build, actually, but yeah, it smells like a like a spring glade. It's like honeysuckle, jasmine, violet. Mm. But they actually have a new candle, and they sent it to me. And it's been sitting on my shelf for weeks, and it's been so hard not to open it because I've been so excited. But I wanted to wait and uh, just kind of unbox it on camera with you guys so you can see my actual live reaction. Doo -doo 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 -doo. All right, let's see here. Here, AM Game Master. <laughs> For those who like to GM their tabletop games in the morning, apparently, because it is coffee, butter, coconut, tonka, vanilla, maple, and honey. <laughs> yeah, oh baby. That, I would wake up for that, for sure, and uh, be ready to play. You know what, I'm gonna light this and like burn it as I do the rest of this video. They have these wood wicks in their bigger candles that kind of give a nice little snap, crackle, and pop. Hopefully it won't be too distracting. Anyway, you guys, seriously, please check out Tabletop Candle Company and send them your money. This will absolutely add to the ambiance of your next game night or game morning, I guess. So go to uh, tabletopcandlecompany.com to check them out. I will put that link in the video description, of course. And if you use the code D4 at checkout, you will save 15% off your entire order. So do that. You will not regret your purchases, I promise. Huge thanks to Tabletop Candle Company. I seriously love you guys. And let's jump into the build. So, at level one, even though the dude's rules are that if we're looking at options for multi-classing with a wizard, we should be starting wizard and be primarily a wizard, if we're going to go moon druid at all, it feels a little crazy to me to not start druid instead. Since moon druids are famously very strong early on, right? Probably too strong, arguably. And then famously also don't scale very well after early game. Let's take advantage of that power spike when it's actually a spike, right? So yes, when we first meet our champion, they are a lover of nature. I think this one might have a particular affinity to like an elven land, a nice enchanted forest perhaps, since they've got that blade singing in their future and that's traditionally something that comes to us from elves, right? But on the other hand, this druid might just really love a water-based environment or even something a little more cosmic like in the astral plane because for our race here, we are gonna go with Gif. That's right, we are making a hippo moonblade. Now, some of you may not love the idea of playing a gif, or a jif, 
or you might not be allowed to play with races from the Spelljammer book at your table or in this particular campaign. If so, no worries. I'd probably go custom lineage here instead to get a free feat and start off this build with an 18 intelligence, which would be fantastic. For the rest of us though, we are here for one main reason, and it's the Gifts Hippo Build feature. Right, we don't really care much about their firearms mastery or even their astral spark, which probably wouldn't apply to our natural weapon attacks when we're in bear form, rules is written though. I could be wrong, most DMs would probably allow it since it's not anything game breaking. But no, we are here because Hippo build not only lets us count as one size larger when determining our carrying and dragging capacity, but unique among races in 5e that get a feature like that, we also get advantage on strength based ability checks and saving throws. And now you're probably starting to guess where I'm going to go with this build, but we will discuss more on why that is so important for us in a minute. For our ability scores, I assume we're going point by as always and say let's get a 15 intelligence and then take our plus two from our race there, a 15 wisdom with a plus one there, and then yeah, a 15 constitution. I kind of hate having that constitution just hanging there at an odd number like that, but we will remedy it eventually. Ultimately though, that is the great thing about being a moon druid, right? As we'll discuss, when you're wild shaped, you take on the physical ability scores of the beast you transform into, but keep your mental ability scores. So this lets us prioritize intelligence and wisdom here and not worry so much about our strength, constitution, or dexterity, right? Which is going to do great things for us, letting us be super sad, single ability score dependent, even as a melee focused blade singing druid, which is not easy to do. Now, I rarely talk about what backgrounds to take on my builds, uh, leaving that up to you to choose to like flavor your character how you want, right? But on this build, I'll just say, make sure you grab something that will give you athletics proficiency. So athlete, outlander, sailor, soldier, etc., etc. For equipment, I'm just gonna say take like the standard stuff. There's nothing special that we're gonna need here on this build. That's one of the beauties of being a moon druid. And then as a druid one, we learn druidic, which is like the special language that druids know to leave signs for one another in nature with twigs and leaves and stuff. And then we get spells. And I'm just gonna say, grab the usual suspects here. Our wisdom modifier is decent, but we're really not going to be increasing it throughout the game. So sure, things like fairy fire could be great for our concentration early on here, giving us advantage on attacks against those who fail their save against it. But otherwise, just grab the usual support and utility suspects here. Guidance to add a d4 on ability checks, good berry for both an efficient heal, and a nice utility spell that keeps you from having to worry about rations and stuff, right? Healing word, of course, for a wonderful bonus action heal from range. And I mean, just a single level dip into Druid here makes us a pretty decent like triage kind of backup support character, and that's cool. But at level two, we get, yes, Wild Shape. Now, most Druids can Wild Shape as an action into a beast with a one quarter challenge rating or lower. They can do this twice per short rest and can stay in Wild Shape form for a number of hours equal to half their Druid level rounded down. So just one hour, right? The beast that we Wild Shape into can't have a swimming speed until Druid level four or a flying speed until Druid level eight, neither of which we will ever reach on this build. As we've said, when wild shape, you take the strength, constitution, and dexterity of the beast, keeping your intelligence, wisdom, and charisma scores. You can't talk, can't cast spells, though you can concentrate on ones you've already cast, and you assume the beast's hit points, though when those expire, you revert back to your humanoid form with any damage that knocked you out of wild shape, carrying over to the damage of your humanoid self. Also, importantly, you get to use whoever has the better saving throw and skill bonus, like your humanoid form or your wild shape form, right? More on that later. And you pick up any skill proficiencies that the beast has, as well as keeping your own. Now, one thing that you can use your wild shape for, since Tasha's Cauldron of Everything anyways, is wild companion, right? This lets us essentially cast the fine familiar spell. And yeah, we should probably have a familiar with us whenever possible because they're just so dang useful for scouting purposes. Or of course, if this works at your table anyways, uh, you know, them taking the help action to give you or an ally advantage on one attack. But I'll just say I would save my wild shape charges here and instead summon my familiar with the find familiar spell that we'll be able to get once we start taking wizard levels, right? That way when we learn it as a wizard, we can cast it as a ritual, right? Saving our spell slots and in this case, saving our wild shape uses. Plus when we cast it with the wizard version of the spell, it lasts until it dies. As opposed to here, if we use a wild shape charge for it, it only lasts like an hour or is it two? Anyway, not long enough. But then yes, at level two, druids get their druidic circle, their subclass, and as I've said, we are going with Circle of the Moon. 
As a Moon Druid, first off, we get Combat Wild Shape, which lets us Wild Shape as a bonus action if we want to, instead of an action. Though, keep in mind that can doesn't mean must, like it annoyingly does in Baldur's Gate 3. So we could still use our action to Wild Shape if we want it, and sometimes we will want to. What's more, we can even use a bonus action to expend a spell slot to heal ourselves for 1d8 per spell level spent while we're in Wild Shape form, yeah? And I think we will be making good use of this to help us stay in wild shape form, which is really nice. Most importantly though, moon druids get circle form, which means that we can transform into a beast of challenge rating one or lower, not, not a quarter or lower like everybody else, right? And that means, yes, we get to be a brown bear. Brown bears are incredibly powerful for a level two character. They're large sized, which is important. They can multi-attack once with their claws, once with their maws, their bite, right? At a plus six to hit for either, doing a D8 plus four damage for the bite or two D6 plus four for the claws. And yeah, that's just a lot more damage than most characters are going to be able to put out at this level to say nothing of the tankiness that it gives us to boot. But at level three, with our wild shape and our subclass under our belt, it's time to make the switch to wizard. Some people might question the wisdom of doing so. You often will hear people say that once you go moon druid, you should just stay moon druid so that you can keep getting better and stronger wild shape forms, right? At least until level 10, people will say. But the problem is, as we've often discussed, those wild shape forms just scale really poorly. At level six, we'd get a small bump by getting a slightly better bear. At level nine, our best options are arguably a downgrade from that. At level 10, sure, you can be an elemental, which is pretty nice, but then you've dumped eight more levels into the class to get there. And I just don't think it's worth the investment unless you want to be a great support and utility focused character that can do okay damage and have some decent tankiness by just staying full moon druid, right? I'm not saying that's a bad or worthless character. It's potentially really good, but it's not what we are building for. Instead, we are going to be getting ways to scale ourselves, our tankiness actually, our damage outside of Druid. And Wizard, surprisingly, yeah, gives us some really nice scaling here. So first up as a Wizard 1, we get Arcane Recovery, which lets us once per day, after a short rest, recover some spent spell slots. And then we get wizard spells, right? And outside of Find Familiar, as I've discussed, I'd probably be focusing here on grabbing stuff that we'll primarily be using when we're not in bear form, whether because we're out of wild shape uses or some other reason. So get a decent ranged damage cantrip like Firebolt or Ray of Frost or Toll the Dead, Shield, of course, and Absorb Elements for some nice defensive buffs, Silvery Barbs because it's just so good and you've managed to quell the Silvery Barbs mob. Hideous Laughter for some fantastic single target control. Of course, you won't be able to cast any of these while in bear form, but that's okay. We don't need them. We're a bear. At level four, we would be a wizard too. And that means, yes, we get our arcane tradition, our wizard subclass. And like I've said, we are going with my favorite, blade singing. So yeah, why is this hippo hippie from outer space becoming a blade singer? I have no idea. I mean, they're not even going to be using a blade. So this one might be a case of, hey DM, I've designed my own custom class here. Don't think of it as a druid to wizard X, but instead I'm going to call it a wild arcanist or an astral druid or a primal mage or something like that. This has been your path and your goal all along, and now you just need some wizard levels to fulfill that vision. I mean, if you've got a great story for a hippo hippie from space who learns how to be a wizard, I'd love to hear about it in the comments. But as a blade singer, we get two features, training in war and song, which gives us light armor proficiency, which we already had, and proficiency in a single one-handed melee weapon that we'll probably never use. So yeah. But we also get Blade Song, and this is just the best thing of all time here. Proficiency bonus times per day. We can now, with a bonus action, start our Blade Song. It lasts for a minute, and so long as we're not wearing medium or heavy armor, check. Using a shield, check. Or making a weapon attack with two hands, check. We get an increase to our move speed by 10 feet, have advantage on acrobatics checks, and best of all, get a bonus to our AC and our concentration checks equal to our intelligence modifier. And just in case it was not clear, there is no reason why we couldn't enjoy these benefits while wild shaped. Remember, wild shape lets us benefit 
from any features from our class, race, or other source, and we can use those features so long as the new form is physically capable of doing so. This isn't a spell. There's nothing written in the Bladesong rules that prohibits us from using this while wild-shaped. And yes, the wonderful thing here is that most Bladesingers are pretty mad, right? Multiple ability score dependent. If they want to be good at weapon attacks, they're going to need a high dexterity. I mean, sure, you could go with strength, but that would leave us with a terrible armor class. And sure, you could go three levels of artificer so that you could attack with your intelligence, but we've already done that, and it's a pretty hefty investment into a half-caster class. But if we're in bear form when fighting, we don't care about what our hippo's dexterity is, really, or strength, or even constitution for that matter. And so this is a pretty cheap way to be a sad but still effective bladesinger. And it also means that we're going to be a bear with a better armor class than we normally would have. It's a 14 for now compared to the brown bear's typical 11. And of course it will scale with an increase to our intelligence. That goes along with our 34 extra hit points that we can also heal using our bonus action and our spell slots, right? And we've even got a really solid bump to our concentration checks. It's a plus six at the moment with the bear's 16 constitution and our intelligence bump of plus three. So yeah, we are a dancing, blade singing bear. Maybe our claws are singing? I don't know, but I love it. At level five, we would be a wizard three, and that means we get second level spells. And sure, while blur, hold person, misty step, mind whip, vortex warp, and web, plus more are all fantastic options and should be considered, I want to specifically mention two that I think we'll be using in combat. First up, enlarge reduce. You could cast this on yourself, grow yourself one size larger, and get an extra d4 of damage on your weapon attacks. The question is, what would happen if you then wild shaped afterwards? Most of you who responded to my poll when I asked about this a couple of weeks ago said you'd become a huge bear in that case, with the benefits of the spell carrying over into your wild-shaped form. I was kind of thinking that rules as written, it probably just makes you a regular large-sized bear and you don't really enjoy any of those benefits from the enlarged spell, but then my friend Chris, a triant monk, chimed in on the Twitter poll and kind of changed my mind. I think there are compelling arguments for both viewpoints and by all means, feel free to continue arguing about it in the comments, but regardless, even most of you who felt like you would lose the benefits of the enlarged spell if you wild shaped after, seemed like you'd allow for a huge bear at your table anyways, because that's awesome. The great thing about being a huge bear here, of course, is that not only would this allow you to get a little extra damage out of your attacks, but more importantly, I think, it would allow you to grapple gargantuan enemies, should you run into any. And yes, I think we should be grappling on this build. More about that in a minute. Anyway, I'd assume that it would be allowed at most tables, but regardless, that's not actually what I think we should be concentrating on most of the time here. I just want to keep the option in my back pocket. Instead, I'm going to say let's use Cloud of Daggers. I love this spell a lot. I think my favorite use of it ever was in the uh, Catch-22 build from a couple of years ago, but the Bardic Brawler, oh, I don't know how many cards I have, I might be out. That build was also fantastic and is still, by the way, my most underrated build of all time, I think. You should totally watch it if you haven't because it's freaking awesome. Anyways, Cloud of Daggers is great. We cast it as an action and then it fills a five foot cube with spinning blades that do 4d4 damage to an enemy, both when they start their turn in the area or when they move into the area for the first time on a, not necessarily just their, turn. The best part is they don't get to save against that damage. They just take it, period. Now, Cloud of Daggers follows the same rules as other spells like it with similar wording such as Moonbeam, Spirit Guardian, and if you need help clarifying how and why and if this works like I say it does, please go look it up in the Sage Advice Compendium. Or just tell me that I'm wrong in the comments section without reading the Sage Advice Compendium. That's fine feed the algorithm. <laughs> we will discuss how we'll be using this spell more in a second, but for now, just know that it's awesome and that it scales by 2d4 for every level we upcast it, right? Okay, at level six, we would be a wizard four, and that means we get our first ability score increase or feat. And I'm going to take a feat here that I don't use often enough, probably. Skill expert. This is such an incredible feat, honestly. It gives us a plus one to an ability score of our choice, 
no restrictions. We'll be bumping intelligence to 18, of course, awesome. It also gives us proficiency in a skill of our choice. Knock yourself out, uh, take athletics if you didn't take a background that gave it to you, because then it also gives us expertise in a skill of our choice. And that is so incredibly wonderful because we can thus take expertise in athletics, making our grapple checks now almost guaranteed to work every time especially since as a GIF, we have advantage on those checks. And just in case you're wondering if we would maintain that advantage from hippo form while wild shaped, again, we retain the benefits of any features from our class, race, or other source while wild shaped, and we can use them so long as the new form is physically capable of doing so. I don't know why a bear wouldn't be capable of having advantage on strength checks. Just because the feature is called hippo form, nothing in the rules specify that it only works while we're in humanoid form, right? Okay, so at level six, it's time for our first damage report. And I want to talk about what combat looks like for us right now, and probably has looked like for us for a couple of levels, really. First off, on round one, we're going to cast Cloud of Daggers. Ideally at the third level, since we have third level spell slots now, thanks to multi-classing two full casters, right? We'll cast the spell right on top of our target, so they take some damage from it at the start of their turn. But then we wild shape with our bonus action and probably run up to our target so that they have to either sit in our cloud or potentially take an opportunity attack from us if they run too far away. On round two, we're going to run up to our target who probably has run away, or at least has kind of skirted around us to get out of the cloud, right? Grapple them, making an athletics check against their athletics or acrobatics check, right? And drag them back into the Cloud of Daggers, where they would take 6d4 damage, both upon entering the cloud on our turn and when they start in the cloud on theirs. For the record, at this point, we should have a plus 10 to our grapple checks with advantage. There's no way we're failing a grapple check here. At level 6... And yes, since we're large, we can grapple huge creatures or smaller. Here's the breakdown of where we get that plus 10 from. In bear form, your strength score changes to 19, right? Or plus 4. We then add double our proficiency bonus that we get from having expertise in athletics. So plus 6 at this level, giving us a total of plus 10. And I've gone over this before, but just in case some of you are questioning whether we would actually have a plus 10 to our athletics check here, since we're wild shape. Here's a quote from Jeremy Crawford in a Sage Advice Dragon Talk video from a few years back. Quote, use your proficiency bonus for anything where you're both proficient, but only if yours is higher, but you use the physical stats of the beast. And so yeah, thanks to skill expert, our proficiency bonus in athletics is higher than the bears. They're not actually even proficient in athletics, but regardless, we use their physical stats. Comprende? So, whew, okay, almost done here. On subsequent rounds, from round three and on, the enemy is taking damage on their turn, and on our turn, we're pulling them out of the spell's area, then pushing them back in, causing them to take the damage again, while also making our bears multi-attack with our bite and claws. I'll assume that we've got advantage from a familiar on the claw attack since it's a little bit higher, 2d6 versus 1d8. All told then, if everything goes according to plan, over the course of a round, they're going to take 12d4 plus 2d6 plus 1d8 plus 8 damage. And while our plus to hit in bear form isn't fantastic, it's only a plus 6, the damage they take from Cloud of Daggers is automatic and does the same amount regardless of their saving throw so long as we've got them grappled. And again, with a plus 10 and advantage, we've got them grappled. Most of this damage is going to happen regardless of the enemy's armor class or saving throw. And so, against an enemy with a 10 armor class, we would on average here do 49 DPR. And against a 15 armor class, it would be hardly less, 45 damage per round. And that is quite good, putting us in the upper half of tier one compared to other sustained damage builds that I've done to date at this level. Now. There are some caveats here, of course. I'm just assuming that we've succeeded in grappling our target. I think it's a safe assumption, but it's not like there's no chance of ever failing, right? It also does take us a minute to get up to full speed, not doing full damage until round three. But also, keep in mind that the majority of the damage that we do is coming from Cloud of Daggers, about two thirds of it. And again, that it applies regardless of enemy AC or save, as long as we've got them grappled. And they are taking at least some of that Cloud of Dagger damage right from round one. What's more, once the first target is dead, it's fairly easy to just rinse and repeat this strategy so long as we can get to a target and drag them back into our Cloud of Daggers. And as a bear with Bladesong active, we've got 50 feet of move speed, so we could be dragging them up to 25 feet on our turn, right, since you drag them at half move speed when they're grappled. 
That's wonderful. On top of it all, we are super tanky with a decent pool of spell slots to self-heal with, and we bring all of the potential utility and support of a druid wizard when we're not wild-shaped. I love this singing bear. They're my favorite bear. And I feel like I've built a lot of bears lately, <laughs> but it's only going to get better from here. At level seven, we would be a wizard five, and that means third level spells. And you probably think I'm taking spirit shroud here, don't you? I mean, we certainly could, along with all the other fantastic third level spells like fear, slow, haste, hypnotic pattern, fireball, tiny hut, catnap, and summon fey, just to name a few favorites. But the reality is, for sustained damage, for our grappling bear selves, we get a lot more mileage out of Cloud of Daggers. Of course, that's with the understanding that you're going to give up an entire action to grapple your enemy. But again, even though you're wasting your action to grapple, doing so lets us apply two rounds of Cloud of Daggers, which by itself is going to do more damage than hitting them with our bear multi-attack, even if we had the extra 1d8 of damage from Spirit Shroud on both of those attacks. Especially when you account for how much less likely we are to land an attack with a plus 6 to hit than we are to successfully grapple here and that the damage is done regardless of their AC. So yes, in combat, I'm probably concentrating on Cloud of Daggers with a fourth level spell slot now to do 8d4 each instance of the damage. And I love being able to, sure, fireball at the beginning of combat if I want to, or if I feel like being a blaster for an encounter instead of a bear, right? Or a controller for an encounter with a nice fear or hypnotic pattern or web. Not to mention bringing some amazing support and utility with like Tiny Hut, catnap. The world is your oyster, Moonsinger. Enjoy. At level 8, we would be a wizard 6, and that means as a blade singer, we get extra attack. And while, yes, we're a little sad that we're not going to be taking much advantage of the best extra attack in game, because for blade singers, right, they can potentially make one weapon attack and then also cast a cantrip instead of take a second weapon attack with the same action. But, of course, Wild Shape prevents us from casting spells, even cantrips, and yeah, that's a bit of a bummer. But we're still really happy to have extra attack. First of all, it means that we could grapple with one of those attacks and still make, say, a claw attack. Or, what I'm actually going to assume we're doing going forward, we could make a grapple with one attack and then shove with our second attack. Both of those things only require one attack. and. Like, let's not forget this little trick, right? Shoving, which, just like grappling, requires us to make a higher athletics roll than our enemy's athletics or acrobatics roll, pushes an enemy or knocks them prone. And if they're already grappled, when we knock them prone, well, since their move speed is zero, they remain prone and cannot stand up, so long as we maintain that grapple. That means that we will have advantage on all of our attacks on subsequent turns, and I will assume as much in damage reports going forward. Also, when we are making actual bear attacks on our turn, there's no reason why now we couldn't, instead of taking the multi-attack action and making one bite and one claw attack, just make two claw attacks. Now that we have extra attack, right? Multi-attack and extra attack do not stack, but we absolutely can choose to use extra attack instead of multi-attack. So we might as well make another 2d6 claw attack instead of a d8 bite attack, right? At level nine, we would be a wizard seven, and that means we get fourth level spells. And while banishment, polymorph, dimension door, greater invisibility, wall of fire, and more are all wonderful, I think I'd at least consider taking fire shield here. It's nice in that it gives us either fire or cold resistance and then deals 2d8 fire or cold damage to an enemy anytime they hit us in melee. But the really great thing about it for this build is that it doesn't require concentration. Now, it lasts 10 minutes, which is nice, but it's not super long. So I would only use this if I somehow felt really confident that a tough fight was going to break out in the next few minutes and I could get the spell going before that happened. The reason I love it though here is because, I mean, at this level, we've got a plus 12 to our grapple checks with advantage. It is so rare that an enemy is going to be able to break out of that. I'm guessing that your grappled enemy is just going to try and hit you almost every time instead of futilely trying to get out of your grapple. I mean, frankly, if they do waste their action doing that, that's a big win for us, right? But even though they will likely be making attacks with disadvantage if we've got them knocked prone, and we are a blade singing bear, we still only have, what, a 15 armor class right now? And so I think at this level, that means we're still probably gonna be getting hit fairly often. I'm not going to assume that we're getting this damage every round when I do damage reports, but 
if we can get fire shield going on ourselves before combat begins, I think we get some nice mileage out of it. Speaking of, at level 9, it is time for our next damage report. Since last check, we've had some nice increases. We can get our enemy grappled and prone in the same round, potentially, thus giving us advantage on our attacks. And we can make two claw attacks on our turn now instead of one bite and one claw. Most importantly, we now have fifth level spell slots to potentially upcast Cloud of Daggers, which would do 10d6 damage, ideally twice per round. And, you know, this is something that I haven't really mentioned yet. Grappling requires a free hand. Rules is written, you could absolutely grapple two enemies here and hold both of them in the spinning blades. Yes, it's a five foot cube, but as Jeremy Crawford has said, that five foot cube doesn't have to snap to the grid. You could place it right between two five foot squares on the grid, right? So that the spell area is in half of both of them. You could then move one enemy into one square and another into the other doing damage to both. Some of you might be wondering whether or not you as the bear would take damage when you're grappling an enemy and holding them in the cloud of daggers. Again, not rules as written. We don't occupy the same space as our grappled enemy. In fact, rules specify that we can't end our turn in the same space as another creature, even if we wanted to. So technically, no. It's like we've got them with our paws and we're holding just enough of them into the cloud of daggers to cut them, but not us, I suppose. Of course, your DM may rule otherwise, which is why you should absolutely talk with them about this character and any character that you're thinking about bringing to their table before you even make the character, just to make sure that everyone's on the same page about how something is gonna work in combat. Anyways, we've also, of course, picked up some nice additional options with third and fourth level wizard spells for those times when we want to blast or control or bring utility or support. We're like a Swiss army bear. At this level, against enemies with a 10 armor class, we would on average do 73 DPR, and against enemies with a 16 AC, it would be 69 damage per round. Nice. And compared to other sustained DPR builds that I've done to date at this level, and again, if you don't know, check in the video description to see links to spreadsheets that show you these comparisons. That leaves us still kind of in the upper half of tier one. In fact, because our damage arc is so flat as the enemy AC increases, thanks to the damage from Cloud of Daggers not caring about enemy AC, and with Cloud of Daggers still accounting for most of our damage, once we get up even into like middling enemy ACs, we're beating out pretty much every other build that I've done to date for sustained damage. That's awesome. At level 10, we would be a wizard eight, and that means we get another ability score increase or feat. And as much as I would love to cap our intelligence at 20 here, I think it actually makes more sense to get resilient constitution. For one thing, it brings our non-bear constitution up to a 16, finally. Phew but then more importantly, lets us add our proficiency bonus to all constitution saves, including our concentration checks, meaning that with Bladesong active, we would be at a plus 11 to those concentration checks now, and that's just really, really good. In fact, holding on to concentration is so important to our damage that you might want to have just done this even earlier. That unfortunately would have meant a much worse grapple check, so I think personally I'd rather not. Alternatively, of course, you could start with a single level in Artificer on this build so that you'd have constitution saving throw proficiency. And then when we get this feat here, maybe consider going Warcaster instead of capping intelligence so that we could also have advantage on those concentration checks. Worth considering. But I'm happy to finally get it here now, making our concentration checks really, really solid. At level 11, we would be a wizard 9, and that means 5th level spells. And while 5th level spells are among among my favorite in the game. The focus here needs to be on two, I think. Wall of Force is just one of the best control spells in the game. It just locks potentially multiple enemies behind an invisible force field, and unless they can teleport or have disintegration, they're just stuck there, unless you lose concentration or otherwise drop the spell. Obviously, using it would be a huge blow to our damage, but that's the beauty of playing a mostly wizard, right? We can choose what we want to do for each combat encounter, and regardless of our choice, we're gonna be really good at that thing. The other spell to consider though here is yes, animate objects. If we used our single sixth level spell slot that we have right now to upcast Cloud of Daggers, we would be doing 24d4 of damage over the course of an entire round, assuming we deal it on both their turn and ours, right? That's 60 damage on average, regardless of their armor class or saving throws, dependent solely on us succeeding at grappling them and holding onto our concentration. If 
Instead, we used that spell slot for animate objects. We could potentially animate 12 tiny objects that each did a d4 plus 4 for a total of 12 d4 plus 48 or 78 damage. Okay, great. 78 is more than 60, so we should use animate objects now, right? Well, not necessarily. In fact, I think I would say probably not. First up, those animated objects only have a plus 8 to hit. I mean, that's not bad, especially if we have an enemy grappled and shoved so the objects have advantage on their attacks. But they also, rules as written, don't do magic damage. So unless your DM rules otherwise, there's a decent likelihood, especially at this level, that the enemy we're fighting will have resistance to the damage animate objects does. Now, if the enemy doesn't have resistance, when we factor in hit chance, crit chance, and enemy armor class, those little objects will do 50 to 70 damage on average, depending on the armor class they're attacking. So about the same as Cloud of Daggers on average. But if the enemy has resistance, it's way worse. And the higher the enemy AC is, of course, the worse animate objects is by comparison. Finally, those animated objects are also fairly vulnerable to area of effect damage, right? A single fireball might wipe out a bunch of them. So in most scenarios, I'm gonna say we'll be better off just sticking with Cloud of Daggers. I like to keep animate objects in my back pocket regardless for those times when we might be running into easy to hit non-resistant enemies or maybe flying enemies that we can't grapple, right? Or if it's a huge battlefield and enemies are spread out all over the place, so like grappling and dragging them back to Cloud of Daggers might be hard to pull off. But when I crunch numbers, I'm actually just going to assume that we're still using Cloud of Daggers upscaled at the highest level that we can possibly scale it. At level 12, we would be a wizard 10, and that means as a blade singer, we get Song of Defense. Now, normally this ability is like situationally useful at best, but for singing bears like us, it's wonderful. It says that when we take damage, any damage, we can use our reaction and a spell slot to reduce the damage by five times the spell slot's level. Of course, if we're using spell slots and reactions to reduce damage to ourselves, right, typically you're gonna wanna be casting shield or absorb elements, you're probably gonna get a lot more mileage out of them. But of course, as a bear, we can't do those things. But now we can reactively use a spell slot to reduce incoming damage because while Song of Defense uses a spell slot, it's specifically not casting a spell. So it isn't prohibited by wild shape. Amazing. Now, to be fair, reducing damage by five times a spell slot's level is only barely better on average than healing for 1d8 per level via Moon Druid's combat wild shape ability. But more often than not, reducing damage beforehand is going to be a lot more efficient than trying to heal from it afterwards with a bonus action, right? Especially if that damage would have knocked us out of wild shape, so you wouldn't be able to heal it back anyways, right? Okay, at level 13, we would be a wizard 11, and that means 6th level spells. And the two front runners here, of course, our mass suggestion, which can sort of just single-handedly end a combat encounter as you tell everyone to go home to their families because their houses are on fire or whatever. And especially since using it doesn't require concentration, it's probably the top pick here. But let's not forget about contingency. This lets us basically pick a different spell of fifth level or lower and cause it to automatically be cast whenever the criteria that we establish when we cast contingency is met. Maybe you could say, if I drop out of wild shape due to taking damage, I cast thunder step so you can teleport to safety. Or like, if I ever lose concentration on cloud of daggers while wild shaped, another cloud of dagger spell automatically appears. The possibilities for using contingency are endless and it's a great like break glass in case of emergency option to have. I would be curious to know what you would be using contingency for in this build. Let me know in the comments, I'm genuinely curious. But at level 13, it's time for our next damage report. And as tends to be the case for full spellcasters, the only real increase to our damage compared to last check is a result of our higher level spells. With a seventh level spell slot now, if we chose to use it for Cloud of Daggers, something that may perhaps be a bit ill-advised, if we're being honest, we would do 28 d4 of damage over a round, potentially, or 80 damage on average, which is kind of incredible. Aside from that, we have gained some really nice defensive increases and, of course, fifth and sixth level spells, which open up all kinds of powerful options as well. But 
At this level, against an enemy with a 10 armor class, we would on average do 103 damage per round. And against an enemy with a 17 AC, it's practically the same, 98 DPR. And yeah, definitely my favorite thing about this build is how little it is impacted by enemy armor class. It's much more impacted by enemies with super high athletics or acrobatics checks, or whether or not they're gargantuan, right? Good thing for us, we're a wizard. So we can pull lots of different rabbits out of our hat if need be. We are the all singing, all dancing bear of the world. Anyways, compared to other sustained DPR builds that I've done to date, we're still in that same place, just kind of like top half of tier one and looking better and better the higher the enemy AC gets. Go Moonsinger go. But at level 14, we would be a wizard 12. And that means we get another ability score increase or feat. And yes, I do think at this point I would bump my intelligence, capping it at 20. No, it's not going to increase our sustained damage in bear form yet but no other feat or ability increase really would, and it will improve our armor class, our concentration checks, which are at an incredible plus 13 now with Bladesong active, and of course, all of our wizard spells when we're not wild shaped. Like I said earlier though, you might wanna consider instead Warcaster here for advantage on those concentration checks. I'm gonna assume that a plus 13 will be good enough most of the time, and then yeah, cap our intelligence instead, because that does actually increase our concentration checks among other things. But yeah, feel free to go another route if you really want. At level 15, we would be a wizard 13, and that means seventh level spells, and yeah, you should probably go force cage because it's like wall of force, but better, and doesn't even require concentration. So now maybe you're like using contingency to say, when I wild shape, summon a force cage. That could be cool. Or yeah, sure, if we wanted to be a big fat cheater face, we could go simulacrum. <laughs> but you know what I want instead? Crown of stars. I mean, if I cared only about damage and nothing else anyways. Might as well see what happens when we use it, right? Crown of Stars also doesn't require concentration, it lasts a whole hour. So I feel pretty okay assuming that we've got it active when combat starts. And again, we could use contingency here to make sure that it's active when combat starts. One thing we have yet to do on our Moonblade is weaponize our bonus action. It's tough because bears don't inherently get something good to do with their bonus action, and I didn't want to concentrate on a spell that did because we get more out of Cloud of Daggers than anything, but now, sure, yeah, let's grab something. Crown of Stars puts seven star-like motes of light orbiting our head, and we can then use a bonus action to fire one of them off as a ranged spell attack. The trick, of course, is that if we're grappling, that'll mean that we have disadvantage on the ranged attack if the enemy is within five feet of us. Of course, if they're grappled and shoved and thus prone, attacks within five feet have advantage. They don't need to be melee attacks necessarily. So those two things should cancel each other out, and we'd just be then making the attack as normal. On a hit, the moat does 4d12 of damage. Not bad. Let's add it to the damage pile, see what happens. At level 16, we would be a wizard 14, and that means we get Song of Victory. And this is something that I've been really excited about getting to this whole build, because it's just perfect for us. I mean, it's perfect for all blade singers, but I love that we get to enjoy it as well. Song of Victory simply lets us add our intelligence modifier to the damage of our melee weapon attacks while blade singing. And as our bear claws are listed specifically as a melee weapon attack, it should work perfectly. I only wish that we had a way to scale our hit chance on our brown bear. I guess I should mention, we haven't all this time had a way to make our bear attacks magical, right? You would have to get to Druid 6 to get that innately. I would hope that you and your DM could work out a way to get around that via like a magic item like Insignia of Claws or something. I personally think DMs should be helping their moon druids the world over scale on their attacks a little bit better, actually, especially in the plus to hit department. But again, something to discuss with your DM, and if they won't allow you to get a magic item like this, honestly, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Again, the majority of our damage, especially at this level, is coming from Cloud of Daggers. The claw attacks are just kind of gravy on top. But finally, for us, at level 17, we would be a wizard 15, and that means we get 8th level spells. And while Dominate Monster, Illusory Dragon, Maze, and more are all like world-bending and counter-altering options, I'm not going to assume that we're using any of them in combat necessarily. So PYF, pick your favorite, and have fun pulling that spell out when you need it most. For our final damage report, then. Since last check, we've now reached that coveted ninth level spell slot holy land, so that 
if we chose, we could upscale Cloud of Daggers to do a whopping 36 D4 of damage in a single round, or 100 damage on average each and every round, all by itself, regardless of the enemy AC. Ay caramba. So long as we can keep them grappled, of course. And we've got a masterful plus 15 to our athletics checks here, with advantage. We've also tacked on an extra 5 damage per claw attack, thanks to Song of Victory, 4d12 per turn from Crown of Stars, and a whole slew of defensive utility support and control potential to boot. And so, against an enemy with a 10 armor class here, we would on average do 159 damage per round, and against an 18 AC, 143 DPR. And this puts us in the same place that we've always been, top half of tier 1 compared to other sustained damage builds that I've made to date at this level. But you know what? That is selling them short. Because once you get to an enemy AC of just 17, a pretty low number for this level, this build is beating every other sustained damage build I've ever done. I did not expect that. So let's break it down in some final thoughts. The tier score for this character, when you just take the damage that they do at each enemy armor class we calculate for at each of the four damage reports and just average it all into one big number, we end up with an 87. Wait, what? <laughs> That's like 10% higher than the previous frontrunner, which was, yeah, the Way of the Arcane Hand Monk that I did with the Dungeon Dudes a couple of weeks ago. And that was based on their amazing Drakenheim book that isn't even official D&D material. So ladies and gentlemen, we have a new frontrunner for sustained damage dealing builds, and it's a singing bear. And believe me, I am just as surprised as you are here. I mean, I've been saying like top half of tier one all this time, so how did they end up with the highest tier score? It's simply because I averaged the DPR for enemy armor class 10 through 25 at levels 6, 9, 13, and 17, right? And I mean, we're never gonna be fighting an enemy with a 25 AC at level six, right? My tier score rating thing is way oversimplified, I know, but on the other hand, at the enemy ACs that we actually will be fighting most of the game, this build really does outshine almost every other build at every level that I've ever done. So I think you could still feel pretty good about keeping them on top here. All right, let's take a deep breath here and do some critical thinking. On the one hand, sure, I make a lot of assumptions to get these numbers, right? Most importantly, I'm assuming that we've got our enemy grappled. We won't always have our enemy grappled, but most of the time, the vast majority of the time, we will. I'm also assuming that we're holding on to concentration, but honestly, I make that assumption on the vast majority of damage dealing builds I have ever done. Concentrating on a spell in D&D 5e is really good. Of course, our ability to hold on to concentration might not be quite as reliable as other builds I've done. I mean, even with Bladesong active, we've still got a pretty easy to hit armor class, especially at mid and late game. And unlike other Bladesingers, we can't cast shield while wild shaped, right? And if we drop concentration, we lose the majority of our damage on this character. For that reason, yeah. You might be better off grabbing Resilient Constitution earlier, or Warcaster instead of capping our intelligence, like I've talked about. Or again, maybe best of all, starting with a level in Artificer, like I mentioned, to get Constitution saving throw proficiency, and then we grab Warcaster at Wizard 8. And I mean, for that matter, if we're going Artificer 1, maybe go Artificer 2 to get the Mind Sharpener infusion, right? In the end, I'm hoping that we've done enough to shore up that concentration with the path that we took. There's definitely a potential weakness here with this build to keep your eye on, and potentially plan around. Another potential weakness here, we're not doing this much damage until round three, right? We've got to cast a spell in wild shape, then grapple and drag, then make attacks while we bring them in and out of Cloud of Daggers. But to be fair, I'd say most of my builds require at least one round of setup, often more. Cheese Grater had to get spike growth down before they could start dragging back and forth, right? The Hexblade Warlock had to cast Darkness or Shadow of Moil on round one before they could start attacking. And it's not like we're doing no damage on rounds one and two here. In fact, we're still getting most of our damage, at least from round two on, thanks to starting off combat with Cloud of Daggers. So we might even be doing better on early rounds with this build than we do on a lot of other builds. And again, I make assumptions about all of my builds, right? My straight Bladesinger build, Bladesinger 2.0 that I linked to already, 
that held the best sustained damage build ever title for years was like assuming that you were always fighting in dim light or darkness to take advantage of shadow blade or that your enemy wasn't resistant to non-magical attacks relying on animated objects for a big portion of their damage and they took some time to ramp up as well so i really don't think that we're asking things of this build that we're not asking of others in the end I always like to go back to the question that Kelly and Monty want to answer in their multi-class videos. Is this druid wizard build better than a straight wizard? I mean, they each gave the combo a D. And honestly, I agree with them for the most part. But maybe when you're looking to combine these two specific subclasses with the express intent to do as much damage as you possibly can, the combo might just be S tier. It might be like S+. And that is what I have loved so much about this series and why I'm so sad that it's over. It has just been such a fun invitation and challenge to try to take something that, at first glance, feels like it just wouldn't be any good and try to find a creative way to make it work. Then, discovering, more often than not, to my great delight, that it can actually be really amazing if you build it right. And that right there is what I love so very much about this game and about multiclassing in this game in particular. As much as I'd love to complain about classes not scaling well enough in 5e, there will always be a part of me that secretly rejoices when classes scale poorly because it gets me looking outside of the box for ways to like Frankenstein something together that continues to be awesome at all levels. So a huge thanks to the Dungeon Dudes for inspiring me for these last several months to do just that. And I mean, it feels really fitting that the last build I ever do inspired by this series ends up being my best damage dealing character of all time, doesn't it? So, that's the build for the week. I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed making it. I had so much fun with this one. If you guys like what I do here, I would appreciate it if you'd consider joining the channel as a member. For just a couple bucks a month, you get access to the library of write-ups that I do for each of these builds so that you can easily recreate the character yourself in-game without having to go back and rewatch the video or take notes. It's also just a great way to support me and the channel financially. Huge shout out and thank you to all my channel members. But you know what? I love all of you guys channel members or not. Thanks so much for watching. Thanks for all that you do for me, for the channel. I hope that you have a really great day and a fantastic week. And if you don't, I hope that you will hang in there. But I also hope that I see you again very soon. So until then, be kind, do good, and take care. Bye. Something in the way she moves Looks my way or calls my name It seems to leave this troubled world behind And I feel fine any time That she's around me now She's around me now Almost all the time And if I'm well you can tell That she's been with me now She's been with me now Quite a long, long time And I feel fine ba -da 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 ah, Late fall day Gray skies Feels like a Feels like a James Taylor kind of day Oh, Canada <clears throat> Little, um, souvenir from my trip to see Kelly and Monty in Toronto You know what? I feel terrible. I don't even know how the Canadian National Anthem goes. I know it goes, oh Canada, but I don't even know if I got the notes right just then. <laughs> I should look that up before singing it next time. Oh, say like, um... Or, I know. <laughs> Sorry. That way, that way as a... Uh, I think I already said honestly. Don't say it twice. And also, once... Blah, blah, blah. The world is your oyster, Moonblade. Enjoy, Moonsinger. And I could get it up before that happened. Don't say that. That sounds a little salacious. <laughs> the possibilities, now that would take up two spell slots, but it's, it's a good idea to do so. I don't even need to talk about that. Oh no, I can't find my druid candle. That's my favorite.